let me out of here. And why? He's crashing it on his head. I usually go by cat, which are my initials. Today, I will be your host and moderator for a look back at Timeline Theatre's production of Bok and Harnick's 1959 Tony Award and Pulitzer Prize winning musical, Fiorello. With politics so much on everyone's mind and an inauguration around the corner, we thought it might be fun to examine Fiorello LaGuardia, the mayor of New York City who took on corruption and the Tammany Hall machine. He was a five foot two liberal progressive Republican of Italian and Jewish descent, making him an unlikely winning candidate. And he went on to serve for three consecutive terms from 1934 to 1945. That said, we're also eager to take a more comprehensive look at his legacy and how that holds up in our current political climate. So today, we're celebrating the Jeff Award winning Timeline Musical with clips from the production interviews with many of the artists who helped make the 2006 original and 2008 remount happen, and a performance from Bethany Thomas, one of the stars of the original production, and Doug Peck, the musical director for both productions. We'll conclude the event with a panel discussion featuring Toy Hutchinson, the Illinois governor's senior advisor on cannabis control and current timeline board member, Mason B. Williams, author of the book City of Ambition, FDR LaGuardia and the Making of Modern New York, and professor in leadership studies and political science at Williams College, and Nick Bowling, Timeline's associate artistic director and the original director of Fiorello. And now to begin, here is Timeline's artistic director, PJ Powers, who starred as the title character. That's right, many of you may not know that PJ sang and danced in this show. Hi, PJ. Hey, Kat. Uh, well, I think that's a bit of an overstatement, but yes, I, I faked my way through through some some songs and uh, happily was surrounded by some insanely talented people. Um, but uh, you might be um, interested in 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 knowing that uh, me playing the role of Fiorello was was a, a bit of a journey. Um, there are, are two what ended up being big things in my life. Um, that Nick Bowling had to talk me into, uh, the first of which was joining him to start a theater company in 1997, something that I thought was not a great idea, but he convinced me otherwise. Uh, and then in 2006, when he told me that he thought I should play the role of Fiorello LaGuardia, and I thought that was 
his worst idea he'd ever had in his life. And, and, and it took him actually many, many months to convince me. And I came up with a long list of other guys who I thought would be far better than me. And he said no to, to all of them. So ultimately I relented and I'm grateful for that. Um, uh, a little story about how Fiorello came to be on our radar and ultimately produced by Timeline. I, I knew nothing of this show. Nick knew very little about this show. I was looking through a, a, a book of all the shows that had won the Pulitzer Prize for Drama in the 20th century. And I got to 1960 and I was like, what, what is Fiorello? I, this is one of only seven musicals in the 20th century to win the Pulitzer. and it, tied the sound of music for the Tony Award and beat Gypsy for, for the Tony Award, um, and yet has never been revived on, on Broadway. And those two shows are revived you know, every five minutes. Um, and it was written by the guys who wrote Fiddler on the Roof. I, I just was uh, astonished. And, and uh, a friend said, oh, you, you should get to know Pierrello. It is, it is perfect for, for Timeline. Timeline should, should do this. So I called Nick, who knows musicals far better than me. And I said, do you know what Fiorello is? And he's, he's like, oh, a little bit. And so we started on this journey to learn more about it and to listen to the music and to read the book. And, and we fell in love and thought that uh, Chicago deserved uh, a production of Fiorello. Fiorello still to this day is absolutely one of my my top favorite shows I've ever done in the city. It was just a great group of people to work with every day. And we all were friends, you know, it was great. We all really, really liked each other. We were all uh, had one uh, vision uh, and we were all together in it. And it was a delight and a joy to work on that play and to work with all of those people. And, and they were all just marvelous. The ensemble of Fiorella was truly one of the best I've ever worked with. And watching that company get a Jeff Ward for best ensemble was one of the most justified awards I've ever seen given. Um, the men of that company, the women of that company, everybody was so special. And you know, in a space like Timeline, there's no upstage, there's no hiding from the audience. It's always fun to perform a show like that where the audience is so enthusiastically into it um, every single night. The concept of timeline that I like so much, which is the dramaturgy and bringing the storytelling of the reality into the play. And so much of that starts in the lobby. But, you know, what if people get there right before curtain? You know, so much of the storytelling that makes the play and the musical really worthwhile and so much information we we get along the way is is given to you during this during the overture and during the entract. Um so I love that we were able to parlay that into into the actual theatrical experience, um, not to take away from the lobby because that is its own really rich um, portion of it, but it was an extension of that for the overture. I love going back in time to sort of see the roots as you kind of go um, go back and and find the yeah the humble roots of of a of a person who is larger than life. All right, my friend. Yeah, to see. 
the meat, inheriting the earth, but we inherit them. I was born in a new world. I was born in a new world. I was born in a new world. Everybody said we were in a new world. I was born 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 in a new world. One of the great blessings of our experience doing Fiorello, really an unexpected one, is the relationship that we developed with the great legend, Mr. Sheldon Harnick. Uh, it started with me basically mailing him a letter um, before we were going to do the show, just asking if he would be willing to have a conversation with me and, and Nick. There were a couple things in the show that we needed to tweak just to fit a smaller cast size and our smaller theater and wanted his his blessing and that opened up an amazing relationship I, i'm curious to hear about your response first walking into timeline space which is probably smaller than than uh where you've been accustomed to seeing uh fiorella or, or many other shows and my what first, it was like seeing that world come alive my first response in walking into the theater was how can they do it? <laughs> there's, there's not enough space. Well, and then I thought, well, but it's a smaller cast. So I thought maybe they've cast people who are very short. <laughs> They're all like four feet two puppets. or something. Yeah, the whole puppets. chorus is just puppets. And then, uh, as I mentioned on another occasion, what was remarkable was to see once the show started with lightning and uh, lighting and, um, and lightning <laughs> and imagination, how the space expanded before yeah. your very eyes. Yeah. And part mm -hmm. of it was through the use of video, uh, of images. Yeah. But uh, what was accomplished in that space, I thought was just astonishing, yeah. astonishing. And the adjustments that had to be made so that it could be done with a small cast were, were equally uh, astonishing. Yeah. I think the set for this was so um, so broad for such a small space, and the challenge of projections often when using um, you know a, a scenic a scenic design that has a, so much utility. There are ladders. There's a lot of space where people can climb and move, and it needs to be so flexible. Is where can you project, and what are surfaces on which you can project that don't feel like a screen and what was, I think, the innovation for me the first time I had done something like this um, was to use non-traditional surfaces or surfaces that were indeed temporary. The number unfair is when Fiorello comes to meet the women who are on strike. And it's definitely not a dance number, but it's a song that needed movement. And we were able to have fun with the props of the women's picket signs. I, I don't know how it came up in conversation, but it was, we want to tell the story. Again, we want to bring in the dramaturgy of, of the real events that were happening um, in the background for the story. How do we show those in the moment? And it's my favorite kind of choreography when it's embracing actual human movement and heightening it to make sense in a musical number, but not to stray away from who these women actually were and what they would be doing in those moments. the most memorable number for me as a choreographer was the politics and poker song um, which is set with several guys sitting around chatting about who they're going to run in the next election while they're playing poker playing with actual cards now it's a very intimate theater and i mean the first row is you, you is right on top of you so they could see what was going on and the 
song outlines a very particular uh, set of hands of poker. And so one of my memories is how painstakingly those cards had to be pre-shuffled so that as, as the cards are being called out in the song, uh, it, it had to land correctly or didn't have to land correctly, but it was good when it did. So it was a wonderful puzzle for me to figure out exactly how the card game worked in and out of the dialogue and the song. Special kind of theatrical magic when it worked and it, it, it worked often. Ah, you sure you don't want to be dealt in? Ah, go ahead. King bets. Cost you five. Tony, up to you. What do you say? I love you. song for Marie. There's a scene early in the show where Fiorello makes a dinner date with her. Right. And then he meets Thea. And for two reasons. One is that he's attracted to Thea, but uh, ostensibly he has to meet with her to find out on what basis he will defend her legally. Anyway, he cancels the dinner date with Marie and she's very upset about it. And we had given Marie a song called Where Do I Go From Here, which told how much she loved him and how disappointed she was. And the song didn't work. And, and Jerry and I recognized it. We went to George Abbott and we said, Mr. Abbott, we think we should cut that song. And he said, boys, no matter how old you get, you're always the boys, you know, especially to Abbott. <laughs> he said, you're absolutely right. I was going to come to you. The song doesn't work. He said, but I've got an idea. He said, here she is, this legal secretary why don't you write a song for her and saying, if I were uh, making the laws, this is the law I would write, that you can't break dates and so forth. And I thought, what a wonderful idea. Marie's Law. S Marie's Law. So I went home and I wrote the lyric and Jerry said it to this bubbling, bouncy tune. And it was wonderful, but that was George Abbott's idea. And that's the kind of thing that made him a great, one of the things that made him a great director. My heart shall stick to your law shall stick to whom it may concern. When a lady loves a gentleman, he must love her in return. Loves a gentleman, he must love her in return. My law, ad hoc, to wit to woo. In re, your law, ad hoc, to wit to woo. When a lady feels affectionate, then the man must follow through. Feels affectionate, then the man must follow through.
Wow, what a fun song. And it's so interesting to hear Sheldon Harnick give us that insider story about the legendary George Abbott. I hope you're enjoying all of this as much as I am. I wish I could have seen the original production. Speaking of the original, I'd like to introduce our next piece, which is from the top of the second act. We are at a rally for LaGuardia's competitor for mayor, James J. Walker, also known as Gentleman Jimmy. The entertainment at that event is a woman named Mitzi, played originally by our own Chicago legend, Bethany Thomas. Today, we have a special treat. Here she is again to sing it for us with equally legendary musical director, Doug Peck. Gentleman Jimmy. The day that Chris Jones was there to review, I was making my big entrance as like, you know, go women. And I slipped and I fell like with my legs up in the air <laughs> and I fell on the ground. And PJ and Michael Kingston just laughed at me and they didn't even help me up. <laughs> we had a scene where Neil 
uh, was guarding a fire alarm on the street to try to keep anybody from coming to pull the fire alarm. And of course, you know, Chekhov's gun, somebody's gonna come and pull the fire alarm. So the scene ended with the fire alarm going off. Um, there was one night, we were a ways through the run that uh, I went to hit the sound cue for the opera music at the start of act two. And you know, everybody's just taken their seats. The lights have just come back up again. And the the go button for the sound was just a space bar on the keyboard. And I accidentally double pumped it. I hit it twice. And so the fire alarm started going off. And um, PJ was on stage and just like looked over at the booth and shot me a look. And we had an emergency stop button. So I stopped it um, quickly, but, uh, and then, you know, backtracked and started the opera music up again. But it was a very jarring way to start act two. And then I remember thinking, at the end of the scene, when the next scene comes up and uh, they're trying to prevent the fire alarm from going off, it's like, well, guess we all know how this scene's gonna end. <laughs> Jerry Box showed up, came to the show, had a great show, but little Tim Box, Terry. I went up my lines. I went up. It was just making sounds. And a he being a happy and a hobby day, ba da ba da, and a little Tim Box. And just talking to the other guys on stage, they were like, what? is happening and you know oh can we not laugh uh, i was totally embarrassed and um floored by it because jerry bach was there but jerry was very sweet very kind and he was he said i loved you he said uh, and don't worry i won't i won't tell sheldon that you uh, screwed up his lyrics which i thought was very nice of him and I'm a crook and I say no sir there is nothing in my past I care to hide I've been taking empty bottles to the grocer and each nickel that I got was put aside that he got was put aside and to a little ten a little tin box that a little tin key unlocks. There is nothing unorthodox about a little tin box. About a little tin box. About a little tin box. In a little tin box. A little tin box. There's a cushion for life's rude shocks. There is faith, hope, and charity. Hard won prosperity. In a little tin box. Initially in 2006, before we did the show and got on the phone with him and he said, um, there's one thing I, I, I he, he's like, I'm, I'm fine with all the changes you want to make. They, they sound good. He said, but there's one thing that I hope you will do um, for me. And we said, sure, Sheldon, anything. He said, well, there's a part of the show that has always nagged at me that I wanted to, to change. It's the moment in the show where Fiorello's wife has died and he's run for mayor and he's lost uh, in a very lopsided vote. He's been sum summarily dismissed. When we were writing this show, I have a recollection that Jerry Bach and I tried to write something for Fiorello at that moment because it's such an emotional moment. I can't recall specifically anything we wrote, but Jerry confirms my recollection that whatever we wrote, we felt it's too self-pitying. We can't use it. He was not that kind of man. He was not self-pitying. So we wound up by just having a minuscule reprise. The name is LaGuardia, L-A-G-U-A-R-D-I-A, -A -A, squares his shoulder, walks off stage. And uh, that began to bother me. That I, And I did take another kept taking cracks at it, trying to avoid anything that sounded self-pitying. He's like, I, I, I really want to write a song for him. Uh, then would you do that? And I was like, an added song for me? That sounds like a terrible idea. But I was like, sure, Sheldon, bring it on. So he wrote um, a, a, a new song and mailed it to me. And I, I have still to this day, I just pulled it out again this week, uh, sheet music in in his handwriting. He he wrote it all out by hand and new lyrics by the great Sheldon Harnick that that he wrote out by hand. So we we did those in two thousand six. This time around will be I think the fourth version 
I kept getting closer, kept getting better. I really slaved at that moment this time. And I think, I think I've, I think I've got it. It has to, it's a, a moment that has to deal with two elements. One is the fact that the voters have just snubbed him. They've just, he doesn't exist. They've voted him out, voted uh, Jimmy Walker in, a man who succeeded mostly on the basis of charm rather than anything else, not accomplishment. So that's one of the elements. And the other is that his wife has died. And uh, knowing that in real life, he went away for a month and just drank until he was ready to come back into real life, I thought, well, we've got to accomplish that in a minute. And it dawned on me that it's a moment on stage. He has dismissed his staff. He said, I'll see you in the office tomorrow, nine o'clock. And they thought, now is the time when he has to go home. And he's got to think, I can't go home because I'll walk into that empty house and everywhere I look, there's going to be a memory of Thea. How can I go home? things I miss about Chicago theater is working with Rebecca Finnegan, like I'm emotional, just thinking of her. I miss her as a person. I miss her voice. I miss playing for her. The She's one of those performers like a Dorothy Loudon or Elaine Stritch where you just, she walks on stage and you start to cry, you start laughing. She's that powerful of a communicator. There were points, I'm sure, that I acted like a fan girl with her. Um, to uh, We'll get to that song, but uh, one of my vividest memories of that show was just having what I considered a front row seat to watch her sing the very next man uh, every night. Uh, I just, it was just so I was an, I was an audience member. I wasn't more as at that point I sat back, I relaxed and I became an audience member and listened to that amazing, wonderful individual sing that song.
waiting for ships that never come in. A girl is likely to miss the boat. One of the changes we made in our production uh, with Sheldon's Blessing uh, is that we ended Act One with the beautiful, beautiful song, um, Till Tomorrow. In an intimate space, ending with the intimate number is really powerful. I can imagine in a Broadway theater in the 50s, you'd want to end with a rousing number and send people to intermission and make sure they come back. But the intimacy of that song and the beauty of those unamplified voices and harmony in our space felt really right. And in the performing of it, you know, I think collectively as a company, I, I just felt that love every night and it was it was a wonderful part of my night. This is why theater's so beautiful, but you, you felt the same sort of energy coming from off stage as you felt on stage. And I just remember at the end of the run of that show, just that parting, that there was such sweetness, but sadness is bittersweet to realize that that was the last time we were gonna sing that song. It's so fulfilling as an audience member that you feel like that you walked out of the theater having received glorious songs, glorious ideas, beautiful characterizations, but in and amongst that, you walk out with this giant slice of life. And it so it, fe it leaves you, you leave feeling um, full. What an incredible look back at a very meaningful production. Thank you so much to all of the artists involved. This is amazing. So for our last event for today, we will be hosting a panel discussion and I will be serving as your moderator today. I am delighted to be joined by these three panelists. First up, Mason B. Williams, who is the Assistant Professor of Leadership Studies and Political Science at Williams College. And most notably, he authored the book, City of Ambition, FDR La Guardia, and the Making of Modern New York. Second, we have Toy Hutchinson, Timeline Board member and former Illinois State Senator. She served in 2009 to 2019, representing the 40th District. And she is currently the Senior Advisor to Governor Pritzker for Cannabis Control. 
And last but certainly not least, we have Nick Bowling, the Associate Artistic Director of Timeline Theatre and the director of both of Timeline's sold out productions of Fiorello in 2006 and 2008. So in today's panel, we're really just hoping to have a chat about the musical as well as the history and politics behind the musical and how that comes to today. So I'm gonna kick us off with a couple of introductory questions and then we will open the floor for questions. If you have a question for us, you can place it in the chat and we'll get it to you as soon as we can. But first, I'm going to chat real quick with our three panelists and we'll. I'd love to just kick it off with Nick. Nick, could you tell us a bit more about why you wanted to direct Fiorello? Uh, hi, Kat. How are you? Um, uh, I'm really thankful to, first of all, uh, the, pan the other panelists that are here and to that amazing uh, group of artists that shared their time and energy with us. Uh, especially Doug and Bethany, who did that uh, recently, that that version of, of Gentleman Jimmy, which is such a knockout. So thanks to everybody, and thanks to all the artists that, um, I love it that so many people are listening um, and are watching online that were in the original productions, which is great. Um, I wanted to direct Fiorello because I was kind of dying to do a musical in at that time period at Timeline. Um, my undergraduate degree was in musical theater and I hadn't done a musical much here in Chicago at the time. And so I, I knew that there were some musicals that had connections to history, but uh, as PJ told earlier, we, we couldn't find one that sort of felt right for us. And, and uh, an actor named Joel Hatch talked to PJ and said, Hey, you should look at Fiorello. And, uh, and we did and uh, fell in love with it for so many reasons. Um, not the least of which is, gosh, um, seeing this made me realize the amazing roles that are in this show. Um, uh, Cassie Slater and Andrew Prestonario played Thea and Rebecca Finnegan played uh, Marie both times and Bethany Thomas and Donica Lynn played Mitzi, which are, and then, and then Maris Hudson, who I love played uh, Do Dora who sings, I love a cop, all these great roles. And then of course, I really just thought that PJ would be so right for Fiorello because he's PJ like Fiorello is like a dog with a bone. He's a guy that does not stop. He's tenacious. And, uh, and, um, you know, and when he wants something, he's he's going to make it happen. It's why I'm so thankful he's leading the theater company and also leading us through this uh, new building that we're working on because it's an enormous challenge, not unlike some of the challenges that LaGuardia faced. And uh, anyway, so we fell in love with the show, knew that not many people in Chicago had ever seen it. And I love the, the story of LaGuardia, this tiny little guy that was such an unexpected hero in a way and who really did amazing things for, um, for people in New York that were you know, considered um, less than at the time immigrants uh, of all stripes. And uh, he's kind of a hero to a lot of those people. So uh, that's why I wanted to look at it. Yeah. And Fiorello is one of the best selling shows in Timeline's history. And you actually did a remount at the end. So that was why you wanted to, why you wanted to do it and why Timeline fell in love with it. What do you think about this show made people so excited to want to watch it. What do you think really clicked with the audience at the time? Maybe one of the big things is that uh, LaGuardia is an unexpected hero. You know, he's not, he wasn't considered good, good looking. He wasn't considered, you know, kind of, he wasn't terribly charming. He was, he was a pain in the butt. Um, and he he was somebody that was rooting out corruption. And so I think that's part of it. And yet the other part of it is that Bach and Harnick write the most charming, beautiful lyrics and songs. Um, they tend to, whereas, you know, Rodgers and Hammerstein are known for writing these enormous big ideas and big sweeping musicals. Bach and Harnick write charming gems of musicals, little thoughtful musicals about little people in a way. Uh, and so I think that's that uh, that appeals to my sensibility. As you can see just from behind me, I like little things, a lot of them around me. So that was part of, you know, I like the little qualities of this show. And I think audiences did too. That's a really interesting use of vocabulary, little things, because Fiorello himself was a little figure. He was only five foot two. 
And it's interesting what you say about uh, LaGuardia as a historical figure, because I think, you know, I think we can all agree he's an interesting person, maybe, maybe polarizing, but this musical really celebrates him. And so I guess this leads me to my next question for Mason. Um, we've been talking a lot about LaGuardia, the character, but LaGuardia is an important historical figure as well, as I'm sure you would agree. Um, he's a critical figure in New York and more broadly US history. Could you tell us a little more about your personal interest in LaGuardia and how that led to you writing a whole book about him? Sure. Well, I, he's a fascinating figure because I think every generation finds their own LaGuardia. Um, the musical Fiorella strikes me as a kind of product of a moment where second and third generation Americans were kind of looking back and telling the story of their communities, um, entrance more closely into the mainstream of American life and that sort of immigrant experience of the early um, to mid 20th centuries. Um, I was writing my book uh, as Michael Bloomberg was mayor of New York and as Barack Obama had come into office and was guiding the country through the Great Recession. And I was looking back to LaGuardia and the New Deal um, through that lens. I was sort of, I was fascinated by number one, how quickly governments were able to sort of step in during the, during the Great Depression, during the New Deal. Um, and really help people through a catastrophic period. I was also interested in the sort of richness of a vision of the public that the New Deal had. You know, um, LaGuardia built swimming pools, public housing, all kinds of parks, not just because they would help the city grow economically, but also because he thought people had a right, even if they couldn't pay for these kinds of things, um, to have access to them. Um, and I wanted to know, you know, how that worked and, and, and so forth. Uh, and in particular, I wanted to know about the role of marginalized communities within the city and pushing their political leaders to do some of these things. Um, and then I guess the last thing I was, I was fascinated with his relationship with Franklin Roosevelt. Um, completely different people from two different political parties who nonetheless came together to form this remarkable political partnership. That's fascinating. I have so many questions for you, but I'm, I'm going to do this one at a time. Um, you, one of the things that is so compelling about LaGuardia is how much he accomplished in office, which you have touched on. That said, this musical also makes a big point that LaGuardia faced challenges trying to get these things happen. And one of the big challenges was Tammany Hall, which was basically the democratic political machine in New York City at that time. And could you tell us a bit more about how LaGuardia might have navigated that challenge and how he managed to get the kind of success, that the political success that he did despite that challenge. Yeah, so, so Tammany Hall um, was the democratic machine in New York um, in those days. And it consists of very highly organized political machine that um, doled out favors in exchange for votes and appointments to nice jobs in exchange for um, kickbacks and so forth. And, New York had this cycle of politics, which was Tammany was in charge most of the time, but every so often they would get a little too corrupt and reformers would storm in and then immediately get voted out again <laughs> um, at the next election. And so what's interesting about LaGuardia is that he's able to kind of beat that reform curse by making a broader coalition, by bringing in organized labor, by bringing in immigrant groups, by bringing in black New Yorkers. Um, so, he, um, it's, it's, it's interesting. He, LaGuardia came to um, sort of anti-machine politics a little later in his career than people realize. He was willing to work with the machine for a while until <laughs> they got caught red-handed doing all the stuff that you saw you know, um, in the little tin box number. Um, and and uh, just like that, I mean, LaGuardia had never, he'd always liked clean government. He'd always, preferred the appointment of experts to political hacks and so forth. But um, in the late 20s, early 30s, he really seized on the political potential of this anti-Tammany posture and, and rode that into power in all sorts of spectacular ways, you know, um, running the party hacks out of the city governments, smashing uh, the slot machines with sledgehammers and so forth. Um, and uh, and it, it, what's, what's fascinating after that point actually is after the first couple of years, he's actually willing to work with some of the mm. some of the less kind of um, corrupt uh, New York Democrats if he needs to. He forms this interesting relationship with the boss of the Bronx, uh, Ed Flynn, who's one of FDR's favorite um, people in the city. 
Um, I tell the story in the book of his relationship with a guy named Peter J. McGinnis, the Duke of Greenpoint, Brooklyn, <laughs> who is like one of these old style political bosses, but he supports LaGuardia in getting some of this legislation through because LaGuardia you know, allows him to take credit for having a new hospital in his neighborhood and so forth. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting how much you talk about cooperation across the aisle, because I feel in today's political climate, things are a little more polarized nowadays. Um, could you talk a bit more about the relationship between LaGuardia and FDR, actually, because I understand you're both from different parties. Can you talk yeah. more about what made their co cooperation so um, functional? So yeah, from, from different parties, um, from completely different backgrounds, right? Um, LaGuardia, the Greenwich Village born, Arizona raised child of immigrants, Roosevelt, the scion of the Hudson Valley aristocracy. You know, LaGuardia is always running around with a scowl on his face. Franklin Roosevelt's famous for his Roosevelt smile. Um, and from different political parties. Um, uh, LaGuardia at one point quipped that he, he referred to Roosevelt as the son of the revolution and himself as the son of the steerage. Um, it's kind of like pointing to this like real gulf in their, in their personal um, biographies. Uh, a few things brought them together, I think. Um, they both came of age in this moment um, in the early 20th century that historians call the progressive era, when um, you know people of all sorts are kind of grappling with these problems of modernity and the rise of modern capitalism. Like on, on the one hand, there's all this new wealth being created by capitalism. On the other hand, there are all these new social problems being created by it. And both Roosevelt and LaGuardia see the government as just a mechanism that people can use to channel these great productive energies of the age into the well-being of the community at large. Um, and so they're both kind of steeped in that way of looking at, at government as a way of like helping the community build itself. Um, and then there's one more piece to this, which is that they need each other once they're in office. Like the, the federal government is not very big um, at the beginning of the Great Depression. Half of the workers in the federal government are still in the post office at that time. So, you know, if you're FDR and you want to create 4 million jobs on useful public projects, how are you going to do that? Well, you're going to partner with the most creative people um, at, the city, uh, at the city level. And that's the basis of the, um, the relationship that makes the New Deal. Yeah, this is fascinating. I feel like there's a lot of links here between how things historically work and how they work as well in the present day, which takes me to Toy, who I think has a very unique perspective here. Um, Toy, I just want to flag too, I bet you are having a challenging time in Springfield right now. So thank you so much for taking the time to join us. So you have a perspective that's a little closer to home for all of us in Chicago, because you have years of political experience in Illinois under your belt. So just to kick us off, could you tell us a bit more about your experience in in politics in, in Illinois at the state level, how that's been like for you? Uh oh, happy to see this. I think it's amazing to see PJ Powers look that young, and um, and and to actually have a conversation about um, you know you know like we go through our lives on a regular basis, and people fly in and out of LaGuardia. And I don't think I think there's a large chunk of society today that doesn't think about who he was, and and the difference now, like. Could we name an airport out of any? Could we name an airport after anybody right now? Like it would, no matter who you, it would offend half the country. There's just no way. Like you could, you could come up with the nicest, most loving person you could come up with, and then the, then fifty percent of the people clearly would come out and then stage a protest about how evil that person was. It is really difficult right now to um, even fathom seeing Democrats and Republicans coming together to talk about how they can work together to get something done, especially in things like infrastructure or, you know, just what is normally considered the public good, the things that you didn't ever used to fight about. You weren't fighting about, you might be, you wouldn't fight about whether the street should be built. You might fight about who's working on the street. But you, you wouldn't fight about whether the street should be built or whether a train station should be built or what those are the things that we now find ourselves seeing everything through this incredible partisan lens, which makes it, um, can you guys hear me? Is it okay? Yeah. It makes it, which makes it really kind of sad when you think about what a forced government can be in people's lives and how right now we have a wide swath of our 
electorate, our population, who believes that it is in and of itself de facto per se corrupt. And um, it really gets in the way of being able to make meaningful change when we need it the most. Um, so I'm loving this trip down memory lane. It's also another reason why I absolutely love being affiliated with Timeline because it makes us, um, and I've been saying this a lot about what this last 2020 was like. I feel like it's December 45th, 2020 still. But this last year, 2020, if it means perfect vision, then it's it's time for us to see things differently. And even taking a history, just a trip back to, to see a previous production with Timeline is so right in the pocket of what the mission of the organization is. So I just, I loved every single second of that. Wonderful. Um, we have a question from the audience here. Um, and it's from um, Spencer Diedrich. Um, We're not stranger to corruption, but who have been the Fiorellos of Chicago history? AOC is the first present and the person I can think of. The and whoever wants to take this question. Um, okay, so, I mean, we've, <laughs> we've had plenty of scandals, you know, that have gone by, like things like, oh, they would call the silver shovel thing, or why do we even have a Shackman decree right now? You're talking about political patronage. In 1972, uh, a man named Shackman filed suit against the Democratic Party of um, Cook County. And it was largely because it was accepted that, in, that to the winner goes the spoils. That when you won an election, you had jobs to hand out, you had favors to hand out, that you had all those things, and then that you were expected to keep, in order to keep your job, um, to be a part of one of the political parties. That decree, you know, because he won that case, has been in existence since 1972, and it extends to the state. So there's a lot of people who still think that the only way you get a job at all is um, to, you know, like if you'd worked on a campaign. I remember my first campaign in 2010 and I used to stand there and be like, I ain't got nothing to give you. I just good government. Like you got to you got to care about <laughs> like what it is we're running for, because there's no way I can be like, you get this job here. You get this job here. It's just it, it is so difficult to hire now because we've been under for over 40 years this decree that says, look. Hiring and firing somebody based on their political beliefs is in and of itself um, unconstitutional. But in policy making positions, you can't necessarily affect the policy that you ran on if you're surrounded by people who believe the opposite thing and, and will try to then go. So there's a we have this kind of bifurcated system that's been in existence for a really long time that I think people, especially now, as we um, are so accustomed to hearing really heightened political speech about everything being corrupt, period. Um, and that, and how deep the history of the machine in Chicago has been in our history and our lore, that there's a lot of assumptions that it still exists today when in so many different ways it doesn't. Um, it, it's been, it's funny because even like the, lots of times you would go out of, out of the country and people would go, oh, you're from Chicago and they go bang, bang, and they're talking about Capone. <laughs> and then you go out of the country later and it was like, you know, so as a black person traveling internationally, I would go there and people always, did, did I know Barack? Do I know Michael Jordan? Do I know Oprah? No, I didn't know any, any the, I didn't know them at all. I was just a little senator from a little town south of Chicago. But there's so much, so much in terms of the history of what Chicago is that I think you can tie to when you look back to how in the world in the late 20s, 20s and 30s, did you have a person standing there talking about building things like swimming pools and places for people to go and recognizing, recognizing that if the public good was served, that that in and of itself was going to be good politics. Right. You no, know, at the time, you know, th there were still some things that were happening. Like there was a riot in Harlem in 1933 and a report that he commissioned, LaGuardia commissioned yeah. the report, but then, but then buried the report. And it's in the 30s where it says, look, this unrest is happening because people are facing this in housing and this in transportation and this in labor and this. And you think about the fact that these sometimes pulling coalitions together also have to fall within the the political and racial and real real, you know, time of the at the time, like what was happening at the time. It's so wonderful now because I think people's eyes are opening again to see a fuller breadth of what history means. And that just like we would say, like, you know, I always go back to my, my Hamilton roots, 
like who lives, who dies, who tells your story, which is of course why we have Mason. <laughs> but it's, I, it's, I see so many parallels. Um, and, and I also see so much hope because now, whenever you do something like that now, like every, I almost feel like we should feel good every time we see an indictment because it means it works and it's illegal and you got caught. <laughs> If I can jump in here, um, first off, I hope we'll get back to talking about the Harlem riot of 35 and, and 43, because like racial equality is both in some ways an accomplishment of LaGuardia's, but also a really great failure of his. Um, it's, it's really an irony when you yeah, look at it. You yeah. have to want to look at it to see that. Right, 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 right. It's like, um, yeah, there was the, the, it showed the headline of LaGuardia sort of responding to the 1943 riot, but then on the other hand, of course, there's a reason. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that there's unrest in, in Harlem in 1943. Um, I, I actually, I um, the original question mentioned Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, um, and I wanted to bring her into the conversation about LaGuardia because I actually see some really striking parallels there. Um, one of the things that made LaGuardia and Roosevelt really effective politicians was the way they had this kind of ease with which they could sort of talk the public through mm -hmm. what the government was doing mm -hmm. and what their goals were and why they were going about it in certain ways, in particular using the new media of the day. Um, radio in both their cases, <laughs> LaGuardia had this kind of sort of fantastic physical charisma, which um, fit really well with the newsreels, which was a big way of getting um, public information at that time. And I think that's a lot of what has made Ocasio Cortez such a phenomenon. Um, is yeah, it's yeah, her her social to. media, yeah. yeah, her, but she's also, you know, the, she made the very kind, kind of very simple, yeah. Um, it down but and without it talking down to people, which That's is right. really remarkable because yeah. there are all these like stylized ways you're supposed to speak politicianese, you know, and it's like, I've in never the age of consultants, that. like it's really refreshing to have somebody I've never, I've never get to about what your government is doing. Um, it's, it, I would I would say for what it is, that point that you just raised, like what ends up happening now is that it's, we are living in a political world where how do you negotiate with people you're sending to kill? <laughs> like you, if you don't recognize that there's something you got to find to come to some sort of a common ground on, we're missing the ability to do that because our our discourse has become so hardened. So it's like, like take taxes. And so somebody like AOC would tell you what taxes pay for. Right, right, right. Like you can like, okay, you can be mad about how many taxes you're paying, but do you want really good universities? Do you want potholes in your street? Do you expect that 911 is like, when you dial 911, someone's gonna show up? Like, how do you think all that stuff happens? And, but what you're fighting against is that taxes are like the theft of your the theft of your wages. Like you, th this is something that's not owned, or that we don't all have a responsibility together to pay for the things that none of us can do by ourselves. I can't build an airport. I can't build a thing. Right. Somebody like AOC can walk into a room and go, "Yeah, you can talk about you know how you may think I don't know anything and you don't know what my bachelor's degree is in you know international relations and you don't know how many you know academic achievements I've done because all they want to talk about is the fact that she was a bartender." And she cuts right through that. And what's happening now is that the ability to communicate without having to go through the traditional things, you don't have to wait for the newsreels to do it. You don't have to wait for someone to package you perfectly. Yeah. You pick up that little Twitter and you pick up that little Instagram and Snapchat or whatever thing you're talking on and you can just talk. And that is a, there's the blessing and the curse of that as we've just seen, but it is an equalizer. And it's an equalizer in a way. It's something that actually democratizes the way we get our political information right now. We're going to have to put our arms around it. I think it's a great point that you just raised. This is a fascinating conversation because I think we're speaking about um, the the ways in which uh, politicians kind of have to navigate obstacles that they are facing and as well as how you deal with opposition. And Toy, at one point you were talking a bit about the Illinois machine and that is the language that kind of echoes what we've been hearing in a musical about the democratic machine of Tammany yeah. Hall. And I would be so curious to hear your thoughts on whether that language is still applicable the language that we saw in the musical specifically mm -hmm. is still applicable to the way Illinois is run today and yeah. whether or whether there is um, whether that's still relevant to the current Illinois Senate really. 
Yeah, no, no, it's I, it's not applicable to the way Illinois is run today. And people would be shocked to find out how hard it is to do that anymore. Like it's it's a different time now. I think now what we're seeing is like the way the way the political party stru structures have are, are organized, especially when we don't teach civics in school. We do not teach people how government works. There are a lot of people who are very angry about government because they've been told to be angry about government for the last 40 years literally for the last 40 years. So at this point, it is much easier to assume that it is the way it's always been if you don't know how it works now. Um, and, it, you know, just the way that we, um, are, the, the way that our discourse is kind of like just fallen by the wayside where it's, it's there's a lot of hyperbole. There's a lot of um, things that are basically unchecked. Like just you, people can say whatever it is they want to say. And it's with impunity at this point, because if everybody's lying, then I don't know who to believe. I don't know who to trust. And any politician that stands up there and says, I'm running against the system. I'm running against Springfield. I'm running against these things. So it's a tacit way of saying they're all corrupt, but not me. <laughs> I'm different. <laughs> I'm totally different. And so when that person then makes a mistake or falls or any of those things, because, you know, I'm the first one to say mistakes and flaws does not mean fraud and rigged. Those are two totally different things. Mm -hmm. We're not at a point now where we um, are, are able to deal with that kind of a that kind of a nuanced conversation. We have so many ways for people to only listen to the people who agree with them and only reinforce what we believe we already know that it is very, um, it's almost rare now to have people sit in a room with someone who's from a totally different place, from a totally different time, who thinks differently than you. Um, it is it is making our ability to, to really solve problems harder than I've ever seen it. Um, so I, it's like I'm sitting here now on the eve of inauguration with a whole lot of hope in my heart and you know, like a, a renewed faith in what it is we can possibly do when we all come together. But I'd be lying if I didn't say that everybody I know and everybody that I work with and all the people who are in this place have a sense of fear right now. That's that that I don't know that we've really as kind of the the people in the public sector, like this class of folks have ever really talked about like that out loud. Um, and that is um, one of those moments. This is one of those moments where we have an incredible problem, but we also have an incredible opportunity. Like if you could take the way LaGuardia would think about this. It's not about how bad it is right now. It's about who we could be in five years, who we wanna be in 10 years. That we gotta, at some point, gotta figure out how to bring back the magic of politics, which really is the art of the possible. Like, I, I don't, we can sit and be mad all day, but what are we gonna do about it? What do you do the next day? Absolutely, that is that is inspiring. Thank you, Toy. I think you know this is an interesting crossroads because we are talking about what has caused this present moment, which is um, you know the ability to communicate more openly, which is which is the double-edged sword, and also the rise of figures as a kind of entertainment figures, you know, political figures becoming sort of entertainment as well. And I think this next question I have is for both Mason and Nick, if you would like to take it, of what it means to reckon with political figures who are, who, who occupy, you know, sources of entertainment and who are valorized in our media because they are entertaining, you know, making musicals about these kinds of people, because I think we can agree that the musical Fiorello really celebrates a man who has accomplished so much good, but also there is a complicated narrative going on. For example, we call Fiorello the, you know, a friend of immigrants, but then it's also true that Fiorello in his time, um, back when the Japanese Americans were being released from their internment camps, they would be, the Fiorello said they couldn't come to New, New York City. So how do we reckon with that kind of legacy and how mm -hmm. do we balance how we portray our politicians in the media versus who our politicians really are? Oh, good question. Maybe I'll, I'll jump in first, Mason, and try to answer that. That's a great question, Kat. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, I think it's, a, it's an interesting question for, in, for, first of all, in our medium, in theater, it's an interesting question about how to 
deal with, in some ways, not just an, a, a character like LaGuardia, but it also, in some ways, a show. Because here you have this classic Pulitzer Prize winning, Tony winning show that's, that's you know, considered uh, a classic in, in many ways. And, you know, how do you approach it uh, and try and try to, you know, kind of respect all of that, but also try to look at it from a more modern perspective and try to look at it fresh and uh, t and try to kind of start to deal with some of those issues that aren't dealt with in the play. So I'm going to try to answer this part of the question. I'll let Mason maybe talk about some, some of the other part of the question. Um, obviously, Bakken Harnick and George Abbott and John Weidman, who wrote this, weren't going to dig into moments like uh, the Japanese internment camps and, and um, LaGuardia not allowing them into New York because while they certainly wanted to dig into the conflicts of LaGuardia's life, external and internal, that little moment that you saw Sheldon talking about and PJ doing that scene is where it becomes an internal conflict for him as well. You know, ultimately they really wanted to expand the love story of Fiorello. They wanted to expand the part that, that you know, because when it comes right down to it, musicals, a lot of, a big part of a musical is, especially in 1959, given this is the world we're coming from, was make people feel good and give them a little, you know, a little sugar with their, you know, a spoonful of sugar with the, the, the medicine of learning about Fiorella LaGuardia. So that was the, I think, the main objective at the time. Of course, we looked at it, and and part part of the reason that you know we cast Betsy, uh, sorry, that we cast Bethany as Mitzi in the show, uh, that's one thing that we tried to do. That we we tried to kind of look at uh, this the, the some of the problems of of race in the show, for example, and explore that. Uh, Bethany sort of brought a an interesting point of view to that song. She sang it as a blues song rather than a, that was originally done as like a big show number uh, by Showgirl. And um, and with the idea, it, and she was actually, that character supporting Tammany actually, but um, so trying to kind of explore uh, that show from a modern perspective and as also from Rebecca's perspective, she sings a song in that show, the song you heard, I shall marry the very next man who asked me, which is, you know, very tough in today's society to even have a kind of a comic song about that. Uh, but Sheldon, smartly, and with the help of a very famous mu musical theater woman, Barbara Cook, took out the a really offensive lyric um, that at the time was meant to be meant to be shocking in a way. She says that um, she, the character actually said, if, if he likes me, who cares how frequently he strikes me? Um, it was all meant in a kind of a sarcastic way, but obviously in modern terms, that's very tough to deal with. So Sheldon, I will say was really great about, and, and putting this context around the show, including a backstory, including all the video and all that was part of our way of trying to kind of, get us modern sense about how to look at Fiorello. And even today, the, the main purpose of this today was as much about this discussion as it was about all that great feel good kind of look at the show, but we wanted to kind of explore LaGuardia and the good and the bad and the ugly, because there's a lot of great things about LaGuardia. And there's a lot of things where he, as Mason said earlier, where he fell short. So I'll ha hand it off to you, Mason, talk more. Um, sure. I guess, um, in a way, I suppose what we're talking about here, uh, at least in part, is the sort of construction of a political leader as a kind of hero. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I think that fails uh, in two ways. Um, the first of which is contemporary. The people who were kind of active in politics and trying to improve the city um, in the 1930s and 40s didn't view LaGuardia as a hero. They viewed him as a politician who was just the kind of tool that they could use to like you know, mobilize and, and claim their rights through. You, if you, if you read LaGuardia's um, correspondence and his, uh, and his mayoral papers, it's, it's filled with letters from community activists saying like, look, you're doing your job, we're doing ours, here's what we need, you know, we're not, we're gonna hold your feet to the fire on this. Um, um, you see all kinds of letter writing campaigns where people are saying like, all right, we've got to force LaGuardia to do the right thing now, right? You know, so these are these are people who are his staunch allies in politics recognize that he's, that they're going to have to make him the best version of himself, right? Um, so this relationship between politicians and citizens is really um, central. 
Um, and the other thing is, yeah, of course, like we should, we should, um, we should reject the temptation to see the past as all good or all bad, um, which is uh, which is not to say that um, that it's always shades of gray. But I think if you look at the failures of somebody like LaGuardia, it kind of tells you more about who he is. Um, so we talked about his relationship um, to New York's black community um, earlier. He on the one hand is intensely admirable in that way. Um, he is stands out among white politicians in the 1930s as thinking that he should take active steps against racism and racial inequality, anti-black racism and racial inequality. He works closely with William White, the president of the NAACP. He's um, even closer with uh, A. Philip Randolph, um, the great black labor leader who, um, it's the architect of the March on Washington. Uh, he, he really admires Randolph in particular and helps both of them, especially Randolph convinced Franklin Roosevelt to do a Fair Employment Practices Committee um, in the run up to World War II. On the other hand, um, he has a, a sort of distorted sense of what structure, what would later become known as structural racism. Like he doesn't understand it. He, he thinks that black New Yorkers in the 1930s and 40s are in the same position that Italian Americans had been when they faced a lot of discrimination in the city in the 1890s, 1900s. Um, but that simply wasn't true. Um, the sort of institutionalized nature of anti-black racism in America was, was not like um, the kind of um, racism confronted by Italian or Jewish Americans. Um, a generation before. And so partly for that reason, you see um, housing discrimination, for instance, or, or segregation, in some ways get worse uh, under LaGuardia, even though he's one of the most progressive figures of the age. Um, the, the, the case of Japanese, uh, people of Japanese descent during World War II is a little different. Um, that's one area uh, in which LaGuardia just absolutely and unequivocally failed. Um, he, he was an out and out racist. Um, in, in several ways, he immediately after Pearl Harbor ordered a roundup um, of Japanese nationals and Japanese American citizens in New York, about 100 to 200 um, who were held, detained on Ellis Island. Um, he closed uh, uh, Japanese restaurants and, and meeting places, ordered Japanese citizens and foreign nationals to remain at home during the war used all kinds of racial epithets that would just make your skin crawl um, in discussing the Pacific theater of the war. Um, and, and as you said, Kat, um, fought tooth and nail uh, against um, people who are perfectly innocent, had been, more than, had been victimized by their own government um, and who posed absolutely no security threat whatsoever from coming to New York um, once the internment camps closed. And, you know, I, um, having spent a lot of time with them, like that issue in particular gives you a sense of how really admirable people can be just fundamentally flawed um, in particular areas. Yeah. It sounds a little like, you know, people are kind of the products of their times, as well as the media that we are watching becomes products of their times. And I think this gives me another question for Nick about bringing things that were produced in a particular time into the contemporary moment. And as a producer, you know, an artistic producer here with us, what do you think is our responsibility when we decide to bring back these historical pieces into the present moment? Uh, I, I think how Mason just, uh, is what he said about, um, you know, um, imperfect politicians, the reality is with every single show we're looking at um, from, from the past and frankly, even some from the present, we find elements that we many times wish were not the way they were, that they weren't maybe written by a white person or for example, a play about China that's written by a white person that we may have, that we that we uh, produced a timeline um, or a, a play about an imperfect character like LaGuardia. Um, but I guess when it comes down to it, we've got to kind of take the whole and say, is it worth exploring and can we, it's, it's why there's a part two to timeline that we're not just doing shows 
that are about history that we're just putting on, entertaining people, giving them a little history lesson, and then bye-bye, have a great day. Um, we're trying to make our experience that the, that the show you watch is the jumping off point. It's step one of a process of exploring and learning. And what we're really hoping is that our audiences want to stay afterwards and have a discussion, come back for a Sunday, Sunday Scholars event about it, read our backstory, go to our lobby, and have all these experiences that are beyond the, the play, beyond the show, so that the show itself doesn't have the full responsibility of being uh, everything that Timeline wants to say about any subject or any, any character. So I guess that's what I'd say. And then at the same time, as a director, I find that I have a responsibility to try to uh, look at a look at a show and to try to bring it to a contemporary audience. Sometimes that means trying to make some changes. It did with Fiorella. We made a lot of changes to the show. And Sheldon, I will say, was just a gem about really being open to it, you know, um, and and hearing those concerns that we had. But at the same time, sometimes you just have to respect the playwright's wishes, which is another value that we have as a company. And we want to have that value. So that's when we then try to balance it by having another story in our lobby, in our backstory, um, trying to give more of the other perspective or any other perspective that we can. I think that is the perfect way to describe that because it's exactly what this is, this conversation right now, which is given color to what it is like this he one he was he's a real person who lived at a real time around real people where real things happened and then you have what happens with the color of history like the way we the way we see it in hindsight and today you know a company like this a theater a theater company like this that has the not only um the ability to but the responsibility to expand the conversation in the talkbacks and in the around the thing we we are this is it's an it's a gift. It really is a gift because what we're seeing is we're living in a time when there are so many people who are just now learning about the fact that they don't know our history. They are just now learning that the version of historical events that we've all been taught in these glossed over history books was based in and of itself in a lot of biases built into what went in those paragraphs on the page. It's no different with playwrights. It's no different with songwriters. It's no different than a lot of the art that comes out at any given point in time. So right now, I just wanted to point out in this horrible time that we've been going through over the last 10 months, I'm so incredibly excited to see what kind of creative stuff comes out of this quarantine because this is when artists do art. This is when we start to tell new stories. And this perspective today is is now um, being blessed with the thing that goes on top of it, that we all have this hunger to learn more and to see things deeper than we did before. And that, um, if anything good came out of that, yeah, this, is, this, is, this discussion even is an example of what's possible. That's really great, Toy. Thank you for that. And mm -hmm. just to say, it's why Timeline's doing more and more modern plays, more and more plays that are written today about history. And, you know, probably in 50 years, we'll look back at these plays and say, oh, they're mm -hmm. problematic. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. And it's okay that people will be We're producing them. <laughs> that's right. That's called progress. And yeah. it's it's how the world should go. Yeah. I was just going to tack on quickly my, my all-time favorite um, sort of thought about examining the failures of, of esteemed figures in the past is, um, from W.E.B. Du Bois, um, who was the editor, it was many things obviously, at the time was editing um, the NAACP's monthly magazine, The Crisis, and posted this um, short little piece um, on Abraham Lincoln's birthday, sort of pointing out some of the ways in which Lincoln was like smutty jokes, he evolved a lot, you know, as we would say in his racial attitudes over the last, especially like 15 years of his life and just all, pointing out all kinds of flaws with Lincoln and said, you know, nonetheless, he became Abraham Lincoln. And a bunch of people wrote in angrily in response to this saying like, how dare you say this about the sainted Abraham Lincoln? And Du Bois pointed out, I wasn't trying to knock Lincoln. I was trying to show that people are capable of growth, right? Um, that even if you have these imperfections, you can still 
go on to become Abraham Lincoln. And of course, what he was saying there was, look, look around, you know, the world in which he was living. People weren't perfect in that world either, right? Um, and so I think that, um, you know, a, a sort of honest reckoning with our history helps us understand two things which we need to keep in mind. One of which is, yes, there are structures, right? Um, through history that we need to engage with, number one. But number two, don't use that as an excuse to be fatalistic um, about the future, you know, because on the other hand, like history is what we make it. People can change, history can change, progress can be made. Absolutely. Thank you so much. That was such a great conversation. So we are almost out of time, but I do want to make sure we can pivot back to some of the great questions our audience has been asking. And I do want to take this question from Marin Robinson, which says, timeline is always so good at looking at history for the lessons it might offer for our current moment. I am curious to see what lessons our panelists, so all three of you, think that LaGuardia's moment offers to us now. I would say um, that it is incumbent upon us to know um, I, when you tell that when when you listen to that story, just like kind of how you had a, the alliances that he created. It's a little microcosm of what it is we're seeing now. Like we have a tendency to be very it's almost like tribalistic in our in our political discourse right now. And you know, you had a Democrat and a Republican that came together. You had all the he was he was conscious of all the various you know all the boroughs, all the get various people who lived in those in those very different kinds of places. Even if he wasn't, you know, he was again a product of his time. But that formula, that that formula, you know, about what government can do in terms of pushing the social good. You know, um, I heard someone talk about our country from Sri Lanka and said, I know a lot of Americans right now, you think you're, you, you think you're an amazing democracy. You think, they say, he said, actually you're sick and you're dying and your institutions are falling apart. And it was striking to me to even hear it said that simply because we need, we need things like a new deal. We need investments in this country. We need to talk about the fact that all of us, all of us play a role in this and all of us need to be a part of what this supposed amazing experience experiment is supposed to be. So when I when I look at a hit when I look at like what do you draw from watching something that happened in you know 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s and and today in 2020, it is we need to get back to how things actually work. Like who puts the stop sign there? How does the subway work? How did, where does the money come from to fix these train systems? Why do these roads look like this? Why are the roads look like this in different places depending on where you live and how much money they make? Why is your education based on your zip code? Why, all of these questions that we have to ask and we have to hold people accountable for figuring out, but understanding our role in figuring out too. Like it's that we play a part in this because there is no highest, we all look at the politicians, but the highest office you can have is a citizen and that's a verb that that requires action you have to participate in this because if you don't have a plan for your life the system does so the only way to be real about the fact that systems produce what they're designed to produce the only way to change what it produces is to change the system so we can be entertained into doing that we can work hard into doing that but it doesn't change the fact that we have to do that I think that's great. And I would just, to add something, would circle back. I was really struck by something Toy said earlier um, about the way in which the modern kind of public sphere places new burdens of responsibility on political leaders, um, especially in this context of really pitched social group identity um, conflicts and so forth. And so, yeah, in a context of deep fear um, and uncertainty, which is very much like the early 1930s in the US, um, there's a real responsibility that political leaders have um, to take responsibility and to tell the truth. Uh, you know, one of the moments last week uh, I found hopeful uh, was um, Senator Romney of Utah um, in his speech when they were deciding whether to certify the Electoral College return said, if you want to help your, your, your constituents, tell them the truth. Um, that kind of burden of responsibility is really um, something political leaders need to take seriously now, I think. And that's something that LaGuardia modeled. 
and I'll I'll be short on my answer, uh, Kat, which is uh, I love the notion. Uh, uh, Toy, you mentioned it earlier too uh, about hope that we that that's something that we've got to hold on to. And also, I think the word that I brought up earlier talking about PJ Powers, but also about LaGuardia is tenacity and it, this tenacious um, dog with a bone kind of uh, need to make change happen. And it's going to take that kind of uh, people, th those sort of people, I think, to, to make these sort of changes happen. Great, we are at time, unfortunately, but thank you so much to our three panelists for your candor and looking back at the history and also your inspiration and in talking about how we can move forward together. So thank you so much to three of you, to all the artists involved and most of all to you, our audience for watching us today. I hope you have enjoyed a great rest of the weekend and thank you so much again. Thanks for coming everyone.